group is the word mathematicians use for a set with an operation that satisfies these axioms. If you've seen other videos about groups on YouTube, then you probably already know that 1. Groups are a natural way to describe symmetries of objects. 2. Finite groups can be decomposed into simple groups, for which we have a complete classification. And 3. This classification is completely ridiculous, consisting of a number of infinite families along with the 26 sporadic groups that don't fit into any of those families, the largest of which contains over 8 times 10 to the 53 elements. This can seem quite strange to someone who doesn't study mathematics. How can such a simple and precise definition lead to such a bizarre classification? Unfortunately, there's no good way of answering that question intuitively. Finding this classification and proving that it is correct and complete took an enormous amount of research carried out by many mathematicians over about half a century, and there's no way I could condense all of that down into a single video without cutting out a lot of important details. So instead, I'm not going to talk about general finite groups. Instead, I'm going to talk about a different mathematical object that is a lot easier to get your hands on. Like finite simple groups, the objects that we'll be discussing have a bizarre classification involving a couple of infinite families and several exceptional individuals that don't fit into the families. But unlike the monster group, which sits in 196,883 dimensional space, the largest exceptional object that we'll find is only 8 dimensional. And now that I say it out loud, I realize that is still a lot of dimensions. The point is, I want to demonstrate that even very simple mathematical foundations can give rise to very awkward structures, and the example I want to use to demonstrate this is Coxeter systems. What I'm going to do is explain and sketchily prove the entire classification of finite Coxeter systems, twice, across two separate videos. In this video, I'm going to complete the classification in a way that is hopefully accessible to viewers who do not have experience with university-level mathematics. That means we will use a lot of combinatorics and a lot of trivia about shapes. If you are someone who already knows about Coxeter systems, then this is going to look like the worst analysis of Coxeter systems you have ever seen, and that is by intention. In the second video, which I'm planning to finish a month or two from now, I'm going to explain how to make the classification massively more elegant using representation theory. However, that video will require some background knowledge of linear algebra. If you don't have that, that's okay. This video should still be digestible if you're willing to engage yourself. With that out of the way, let's get started. Let's start with a small example. First, consider all the words, by which I just mean strings of letters, that you can make with the letters S and T. We have two words of length 1, four words of length 2, eight words of length 3, and so on. For technical reasons, we also consider the empty word, containing no letters, to be a word, and we denote it E for empty. Now what I'm going to do is give you two rules for transforming one word into another. The first rule is that you can replace any pair of consecutive identical letters with the empty word. You can also go the other way and insert any double letter into a word. The second rule is that you can replace STS with TST and vice versa. Let's now group all of these words into equivalence classes using these rules. For example, T is in the same equivalence class as TTT, SST, and TSS. In total, we have six equivalence classes. But we've only gone up to length three. What if we consider longer words? Do we get more classes? In this case, no. Let's say we're given a word of length four or longer. If there are double letters, we can remove them. And if there aren't double letters, then the word is an alternating sequence of S and T, so we can swap SDS with TST and produce a double letter. That means if a word is longer than three letters, we can always reduce it down to at most three letters, and that means these six equivalence classes cover the entire space of words. What I've just described is a Coxeter system. Specifically, this Coxeter system is comprised of a set of two generators, which will denote capital S, and a set of six elements, the equivalence classes, which will denote W. Usually when notating elements, we just pick a single representative from each class, now, given two elements, we can stick them together to get an element in another equivalence class. That gives us an operation on our set of equivalence classes, which we like to denote by multiplication. And if you know about groups, you can check that this operation gives the set W the structure of a group. Okay, let's do a more complicated example. This time, there will be three letters, A, B, and C. Once again, we have the first rule that double letters are equivalent to the empty word, but now the second rule is a bit different. This time we have the relations ABAB equals BABA, AC equals CA, and BCB equals CBC. Once again, you can start listing out words and seeing which ones are equivalent. It might take you some time though. In fact, I don't recommend you do this one by hand, because this Coxeter system turns out to have 48 elements. 
Now, I mentioned that these Coxeter systems are groups, and groups naturally describe the symmetries of objects. So what objects do these systems represent? Well, let's look at the symmetry group of a triangle. A triangle has six symmetries, three reflections, two rotations, and the identity transformation that doesn't do anything. If we pick two of the reflections, let's call them S and T, any other symmetry can be obtained from a sequence of S and T. One rotation is ST, the other is TS, and the remaining reflection can be written as STS or TST. We also have that SS and TT are equal to the identity transformation. So the symmetry group of a triangle is exactly that first Coxeter system we looked at. What about the other system, the one with 48 elements? That one turns out to be the symmetry group of a cube, where A, B, and C correspond to reflections about these three planes. To see why this is, notice that if we apply A followed by B, we get a rotation by 90 degrees. So ABAB is a rotation by 180 degrees, which is just the same as BABA. I'll let you check the relations with the C plane yourself if you want to. Okay, now that I've given some examples, let's give a formal definition. A Coxeter system is a group generated by a finite set of generators under relations of the following form. Every generator squares to the identity, and each pair of generators has what is called a braid relation, which states that an alternating sequence of a certain length is equal to the opposite alternating sequence of the same length. It's also possible for a pair of generators to not have a relation, in which case we say the length of the braid relation between them is infinite. So the only things that determine a Coxeter system are the number of generators and the braid lengths between them. Because of this, we're going to notate a Coxeter system using a graph whose nodes are the generators and whose edges are labeled by the braid lengths. For example, here are the graphs for the first two Coxeter systems we looked at. Except we're going to make two important simplifications. First, we're going to remove any edges labeled 2, and second, we're going to leave braid lengths of 3 unlabeled. So, just to give an example going in the other direction, what Coxeter system would this graph correspond to? Well, it has four generators, let's call them PQRS, it has a braid relation of length 5, two braid relations of length 3, and any pairs of nodes that do not have an edge are given a braid relation of length 2. This, along with the fact that all the generators square to the identity, gives us all the rules we need to compute the Coxeter system. Okay, we're now almost ready to start classifying Coxeter systems. But first I want to make three remarks. Remark one, there's an important reason we're leaving out edges with the label two. A braid relation of length two is something like st equals ts, so we can swap s and t. We say that s and t commute. An important case of this is if the Coxeter graph has two disconnected components, meaning everything in the first component has a length two braid relation with everything in the second. When this happens, given an arbitrary word, you can shuffle the letters around so that the generators in the first component are on the left, and the ones in the second are on the right. That means every element of the group is a product of a word in one subgraph with a word in the other subgraph. So the entire Coxeter group can be split into a Cartesian product of two Coxeter groups, whose graphs are the two disconnected subgraphs. That means when we're classifying Coxeter systems, we're only interested in irreducible systems, ones whose graphs are fully connected. The reducible systems will then simply be products of these. Remark 2. If you are particularly attentive during the first part of this video, you might have thought this. How do we know that those six equivalence classes we found in the first example are actually distinct? What if there were a way to start with a word in one equivalence class, and then add pairs of generators to get a bigger word, then shuffle things around before cancelling out different pairs and getting a word in a different equivalence class? This certainly does happen in other areas of mathematics, where you have to make something more complicated before you can make it simpler. I'm looking at you, not theory. Fortunately, though, you can prove with a bit of effort that this doesn't happen. Any two reduced expressions of the same element, that is, words of minimal length, are always related by a sequence of braid moves without adding or removing any pairs. This is called the word property, and it's very important for doing combinatorics in the world of Coxeter systems. Remark 3. I've given two examples of how Coxeter systems relate to groups, but I should stress that this is not a one-to-one -one relationship, in either direction. There are groups that can't be expressed as Coxeter groups, and even worse, there are groups that can be described as Coxeter groups in multiple different ways. For example, to describe the symmetry group of a hexagon as a Coxeter group, you can either take these two reflections, which gives you this graph, or these two reflections and a rotation by 180 degrees, which gives you this graph. These are isomorphic as groups, but not isomorphic as Coxeter systems. 
I should also mention that actually proving that a certain finite group is a certain Coxeter system is quite hard in general. You need to show that there are no other relations than the Coxeter relations. Because of this, I'm going to skim over a lot of the details on why certain Coxeter systems are equal to certain reflection groups. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start the classification. Let's start with this Coxeter group. This is one of the simplest examples of an infinite Coxeter group. Why is it infinite? Well, let's denote the generators x, y, and z. The expression x, y, z is reduced. We can't apply any braid moves, and so x, y, z is not equal to any shorter expression by the word property. Similarly, the expression x, y, z, x is also reduced, and so is x, y, z, x, y, and x, y, z, x, y, z, and so on. We can repeat this to get an arbitrary number of distinct elements, and this means the Coxeter system must be infinite. Now, by the same method, the Coxeter group whose graph is a cycle of four nodes, w, x, y, and z, is also infinite. In fact, any cycle results in an infinite Coxeter system. This strategy still works if any of the edges in the cycle are labeled, and it still works if the cycle is part of a larger graph. This is a huge step forward, because we now know that if a Coxeter system is finite, then its graph must not have any cycles anywhere, which means it must have a tree structure. Are there any other Coxeter systems that we can apply this strategy to? This is where we'll make the video a bit more interactive. I'm going to show you a Coxeter graph, and I want you to pause the video and see if you can generate infinitely many elements of the Coxeter system. Here it is. And just to jog your memory, here are the braid relations that you can perform. Can you show that this Coxeter system is infinite? The answer is quite simple. Just trace back and forth along the chain. Now, if there weren't any labeled edges, then this technique wouldn't work, because when you turn back, you get an alternating sequence of three generators, which you can apply a braid move to. But with these edge labels, we would need four alternating generators in order to apply a braid move, which means all of these elements we've constructed are braid move free. That means they're all reduced expressions for distinct elements of the Coxeter group, and since there are infinitely many of them, the Coxeter group must be infinite. So now we've shown that if a Coxeter system has two or more labeled edges, or a cycle in its graph, then it must be infinite. So the finite Coxeter systems are all trees with at most one labeled edge. We also know that this label can't be infinity, because then we immediately get infinitely many elements like this. We've cut out a lot of cases, and now we're going to cut them down even further by cutting down the branches of the trees. Let's do another exercise. This one's a little harder. See if you can construct an infinite sequence of elements of this Coxeter system. Figured it out yet? Let's do this. Go back and forth along the chain like we did before, but when you get to a branch, add on both the branching generators before going back. Now, this isn't braid move free, because we can apply a length 2 braid move to swap these branching generators, but that's all that we can do. Swapping them doesn't introduce any new braid moves that we can perform, so these words are all still reduced. This tells us that the graphs of finite Coxeter systems have at most one branching point. Moreover, if we shorten this chain to be only one node, and then apply the same trick to show that this system is infinite, we now also know that if there is a branching point in a finite system, then it must be a three-way junction and not a four-way junction or bigger. And we can also swap out one of our branches with a labeled edge and get another infinite system by the same trick, which means that if there are any branches, there can't be a labeled edge. There's one more exercise that I want you to try, and this one's harder than all the previous ones. Here is a three-way junction with two nodes on each branch. Can you show that this is infinite? To solve this one, let's look at the generator B on the outside. B commutes with every generator except A, so to stop it cancelling with the next or previous B in the word, we have to bound it on either side with an A. But if we do this, straight away we get a length 3 braid move, so let's also stick an X in the middle. This word is now reduced. We can swap B and X, but we can't do anything else. Now let's do the same thing with the other two branches, and then take these three pieces and stick them together in a cycle. I'll leave you to check for yourself that while it is possible to move generators around with length 2 braid moves, it's not possible to rearrange this word to get a length 3 braid move. Continuing this pattern gives us infinitely many elements, and we're done. 
So if this particular junction is not allowed, then we know that if a finite system has a junction, then one of the branches has only one node. The other two branches then form a straight chain which this node is branching out from. Combining this with the other results, we can summarize what we've found so far as follows. If an irreducible Coxeter system is finite, then its graph must be a single chain of nodes, plus at most one additional feature, which can either be a labeled edge not equal to infinity somewhere on the chain, or a single node branching out from the chain. Okay, we've done a lot of work from the top down, starting with all possible Coxeter systems and eliminating ones which we know are infinite. But that's not going to work on its own. We also have to go from the bottom up and show that certain Coxeter systems are finite. The hope is that eventually these two processes will meet in the middle, giving us a complete classification. So to start some of that bottom-up work, let's look at two families of finite Coxeter systems which we've actually already seen. The first is an extension of that triangle group we started the video with. Let's number the vertices of the triangle 1, 2, and 3. Take a look at all the rotations and reflections of the triangle, and notice that each one gives us a permutation, that is a rearranging, of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. In fact, every permutation of 1, 2, and 3 corresponds to a symmetry of the triangle. This group of permutations is given a special name, the third symmetric group, and it gives us a hint at how we can find some more finite Coxeter systems. Let's consider the fourth symmetric group, consisting of permutations of four objects. Now, take a moment to convince yourself that any such permutation can be reached by just swapping adjacent objects. For example, if I want to get 4, 3, 2, 1, I just need to perform these swaps. Now, let's call these swaps S, T, and U. Applying any of them twice gets you back to where you started, and notice that if you start with 1, 2, 3, 4, and apply S, then T, then S, you get the arrangement 3, 2, 1, 4, which is the same as applying T, then S, then T. This is starting to look like a Coxeter system. I'll leave you to fill in some of the details, but with a bit of effort you can show that the Coxeter group with this graph coincides with this permutation group. In the same way, you can show that the fifth symmetric group is a Coxeter group with this graph, and so on. This gives us an infinite family of finite Coxeter systems whose graphs are just straight chains with no branches or edge labels. We call this family Type A, and index the systems by the number of generators they have. I should note that the letters we're using in this video are only standard for Coxeter systems and things relating to Coxeter systems. In group theory, the symmetric groups are usually labelled with the letter S instead, and there will be a couple of other groups in the video which have different names to what we'll be using, so just be careful of that if you're doing more general group theory research. Now that we know a straight chain gives a finite system, we can start focusing on those additional features, labelled edges and branching nodes. And for this, we've already seen another example, the cube group, which had this Coxeter graph. Can we extend this to an infinite family as well? Well, if we go down a dimension, you can check for yourself that the symmetry group of a square is generated by these two reflections, giving us this Coxeter group. So, square, cube, what comes next? There's a four-dimensional variant of a cube called a tesseract, and it turns out that the symmetry group of a tesseract is a Coxeter system with this graph. And this continues up through the dimensions. The Coxeter system describing an n-dimensional hypercube is a chain of n generators with a label of 4 at one end. This gives us a second infinite family of Coxeter systems, which we call type B. The square is B2, the cube is B3, and so on. An interesting thing to note here is that the type A systems also correspond to geometric objects. A3 is the symmetry group of a tetrahedron, and A4 is the symmetry group of a four-dimensional object called the five cell. Each of these is called a simplex, and type A gives us the symmetry groups of all regular simplices. More generally, if a Coxeter system is describing the symmetry group of a geometric object, then the number of generators is the number of dimensions that the object lives in, except in degenerate cases like prisms. Now, there's another infinite family hidden in the groups we've examined so far. Let's take our cube with its symmetry group of B3 and remove half the vertices. If we link up the remaining vertices, we get a tetrahedron. This suggests that these systems B3 and A3 are related somehow. Let's figure out how. The symmetry group of the cube is generated by reflections through these three planes, which, as before, I'll call A, B, and C. 
By the way, I picked these three planes because they border this little triangle on the top surface. So essentially what happens is each element of the group moves this triangle to one of the other triangles across the cube. We can try to do the same thing for the tetrahedron. This little triangle on the face of the tetrahedron is bordered by the planes B and C, but we need a new plane to get the third edge. Now, this new reflection can be written in terms of A and B. If we perform the reflections A, B, A, we get the same result as reflection through this plane. This tells us that the symmetry group of a tetrahedron is the subgroup of B3 generated by B, C, and A, B, A. Does this make sense from the combinatorial side of things? Well, B, C, B equals C, B, C, B, A, B, A equals A, B, A, B, and with a bit of working out, you can show that ABAC ABA equals C ABAC. These are exactly the Bray relations of the Coxeter system A3, generated by B, C, and ABA. Okay, so why are we doing this? We already know about A3. Well, now we can apply the same trick to the higher dimensional case. Unfortunately, it's a bit difficult to visualize because we have to work in four dimensions or higher, so let's just stick to the combinatorics. The system B4, with generators A, B, C, and D, contains a subgroup generated by B, C, D, and A, B, A. Once again, we have a length 3 braid move between A, B, A, and C, and D passes straight through A, B, A, giving us a length 2 braid move. That gives us this new Coxeter system that we haven't seen before. But it gets better. This trick works for every B-type system. That gives us a new, infinite family of finite Coxeter systems, and we need to give this a name. A, B, what comes next? That's right, it's type D. I definitely know how the alphabet works. Just as a side note, the explanation I've given isn't exactly rigorous, since it's still possible that infinitely many elements in Dn are mapped to the same element in Bn. To fix this, you can show that this mapping is injective, but I'm going to skip over that because it's just fiddly combinatorics. Now, the geometric side of this process still applies. If you cut out half the vertices of a hypercube, you get something called a demi-hypercube. But there's a small hiccup with this. The reflection group of the four-dimensional demi-hypercube, the demi-tesseract, is not the Coxeter system D4. It's actually B4, the same reflection group as the cube. The reason for this is that the process that we came up with for generating the D-type systems doesn't reach every symmetry of the demi-tesseract which, by the way, happens to be an object called the 16 cell. To give a simpler example, A2 is the symmetry group of a triangle, and it is also a group of symmetries of a hexagon. But it's not all the symmetries. A hexagon has more symmetries that are not in the group A2. We could fix this by warping the hexagon to remove some of the symmetries, and in theory we could do this with the 4 demicube as well. But I'm not going to do this because visualizing things in 4 dimensions is hard. So far, we've found three infinite families, type A, type B, and type D. There's one more we need to cover. Recall that A2 is the symmetry group of a triangle, while B2 is the symmetry group of a square. What's the symmetry group of a pentagon? Naturally, you'd expect it to be this Coxeter system, and you'd be right. In fact, the Coxeter system with two generators and an edge label of M is the symmetry group of a regular M-sided polygon. To see why this is, take the generators S and T to be these reflections. Notice that if we apply S and then T, we get a rotation by one side. So if we perform this rotation M times, we should get back to where we started. Does this line up with the combinatorics? Well, if we write out S and T M times, we can take the first M terms and flip them with a braid move. And now look, everything cancels in the middle and we get the empty word. So this equation is equivalent to the braid relation. As a side note, this property that st written out m times gives you the empty word actually gives us a nice compact way to write Coxeter relations. All of the relations can be written in this form, with the number m equal to 1 if i and j are the same. If we arrange the braid lengths m into a grid, we get a matrix called the Coxeter matrix. This is another way of notating the Coxeter system that we could use instead of the graph. a2 would look like this, b3 looks like this, and so on. Anyway, back to polygons, these symmetry groups are commonly called the dihedral groups, but in the Coxeter classification, we like labelling things with letters, and we're already using the letter D. Conveniently, there's one letter we've missed out so far. That's right, it's type I. Look, maybe I should just put you out of your misery. There isn't a type C. Or more correctly, type C is the same as type B. 
I'll explain why in the next video. By convention, we use this little subscript to denote the number of nodes, but that means all of these groups are called I2, so to distinguish them, we put the braid length in brackets. The pentagon is I25, the hexagon is I26, and so on. Now, I23 is the same as A2, and I24 is the same as B2, and we've seen that these extend to infinite families. Do any of these other I systems do the same? Are we going to get infinitely many infinite families? It turns out, no. Here is a new exercise. Can you show that this Coxeter system is infinite? Here's the answer. Write STST, and then a U, and then repeat. Notice that we can swap a U with an S, but this doesn't do anything because we can't make STSTST. So this sequence generates infinitely many elements. And moreover, this trick still works if we replace the edge label with a higher number like 7 or 8. So in one fell swoop, we have finished the classification for systems that have a labelled edge of 6 or greater. But we skipped over 5, and there was a good reason for doing that. It turns out that this Coxeter system is finite. But what shape is it the reflection group of? See if you can figure it out yourself. What is a three-dimensional shape with five-fold symmetry? If you've ever played Dungeons & Dragons, you should already know the answer, because you should be familiar with these dice, the d12 and the d20. These have the same symmetry group, and it's this finite Coxeter system, which we call H3. So H2, or I25, is a pentagon. H3 is a dodecahedron. Is there an H4? Yes, it turns out to be a four-dimensional object called a hyperdodecahedron. I used to have a giant model of this in my house. Can we go higher? How big is this H family? The answer is, that's it. There's no other irreducible finite systems with an edge label of 5. To prove this, we first need to show that this system is infinite, which will ensure that the label of 5 must be at the end of the chain and not anywhere in the middle. See if you can find an infinite sequence of generators. Here's a hint, you can use a similar technique to what we used for this system. Here's the answer. Write R, then STS, then U, then TST, then repeat. Once again, you can perform some length 2 braid moves, but no length 3 or 5 ones. To finish off labels of 5, we just need to prove that this system is infinite. This one is a lot tougher to figure out, so I'm going to come back to it later on in the video. And with that, we have found our first exceptional finite Coxeter systems, H3 and H4, which do not fit into any infinite families. You might now be looking back up at this system and thinking, aha, we can use this strategy on labels of 4 as well. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work. You can swap U with S, and then you can do some braid moves, and everything starts to get very complicated, and eventually you can reduce it down to something smaller. Please don't try this yourself though, because I checked this with a computer program, and if I did everything correctly, you need 25 letters to get a word that's reducible, and reducing it takes a huge number of steps. Fortunately, it is still possible to show that this system is infinite. Once again, I'll wait to give the answer until later in the video. That means the only case with a label of 4 that we haven't properly checked is this one with 4 generators. And amazingly, this turns out to be finite. This group is called F4. Come to think of it, I don't know why we even write the subscript when there's only one group in type F. I guess it just looks nice. F4 is the symmetry group of a 4-dimensional object called the 24 cell, also known by these names. Yeah, I don't really have a good intuition for this, but there's a good reason for that. The 24 cell is unique in that there are no analogous shapes in higher or lower dimensions. As of this video, Wikipedia has a citation for this, attributed to none other than Donald Coxeter himself. Okay, we've done a lot of work, so let's recap everything that we've seen so far. First, we showed that every finite system is just a chain of nodes with at most one labelled edge or branching node. Then we found three infinite families, A, which is just straight chains, B, chains of a label of four at one end, and D, chains of a branching node at one end. Then we showed that all the Coxon systems with only two generators form another infinite family, which we called type I, and then showed that these are the only finite systems with edge labels of six or higher. Then we finished off labels of 4 and 5, finding three new exceptional systems, H3, H4, and F4. 
That leaves only one family of cases left to check, and that is chains with a branching node somewhere in the middle. We're going to start with this Cox of a system, because if we can show that this is infinite, then every branching chain which has at least three nodes on both sides of the branch must be infinite, leaving only those of two nodes on one side. And this is where I'm going to bring back those other two infinite cases I put aside earlier on, because you can use a similar strategy for all three of these. On each of them, I'm going to mark the middle node X, because you can do a similar construction to what we did for the three-way junction. Create two reduced words, each using all the generators on one side of X, and then stick them together in an alternating sequence. You can pause the video now if you want to figure out the answer, but be warned they're a lot tougher. There's probably other ways of doing this, but this is the simplest method I could come up with. The first two have a couple of brain moves you can apply to the longer segment, but once you do these you can't go any further, so these sequences still generate infinitely many elements. Fun fact, the connection between this system and the three-way junction is similar to the connection between the B and D types. In the related context of Dinkin diagrams, this connection is called folding, which is way outside the scope of both this video and my knowledge. So with that out of the way, the last step is to check these cases with two nodes on one side of the branch. Even the smallest of these has six nodes, meaning that if it is finite, it is the reflection group of a six-dimensional shape. There's not going to be an easy way to intuit these, so I'm just going to jump straight to the answer. This one is finite. This one is also finite. This one is also finite. But the next one's infinite. Now, I would say, show this is infinite as an exercise, but that's not really fair, because I myself couldn't figure out an infinite sequence of elements in this Cox of the system. And this really annoyed me, because as you've already seen, I took a lot of care figuring out infinite sequences of elements in all the other exercises. After a bit of searching, I was lucky to find a paper which claimed to have classified these sorts of infinite reduced words. But the formulas for them require you to insert reduced expressions for the longest elements in the system, and I don't know how to find that either. So, sorry, I guess our combinatorial journey ends here. Suffice to say, there are other ways to prove that this system is infinite, which we will see in the next video. We call these three finite systems E6, E7, and E8. And with that, we're done. We've finished the classification. <coughs> so, what have we learned from all of this? Well, we've learned that the irreducible finite coxeter systems comprise four infinite families and six exceptional systems, but in addition to that, we've learned that it's not always enough just to compute things. We were able to grasp the entire classification and gain some pieces of intuition for how different coxeter systems can be finite or infinite, but the methods we used were not very systematic, and didn't really give us any understanding of anything outside of coxeter systems themselves. This whole process feels very unsatisfying. We found the answer but we don't have a good universal intuition for why it is the answer. This is the situation that we're currently in for finite simple groups. But for Coxeter groups, it turns out we can do a lot better. With a bit more powerful tools, we can find all the finite Coxeter groups much more efficiently and more rigorously. The tool that we need to apply is called representation theory, which in very general terms is a framework for the connection to symmetric shapes that we've been using throughout this video. To give a small taster of that, you might notice that in addition to skipping over the letter C, we also skipped G. That's because G2 is just another name for I26, the symmetry group of a hexagon. Even though it doesn't extend to an infinite family, G2 gets a special name because it has a lot of important properties that higher members of the I family don't, and these properties are somewhat related to the fact that hexagons are able to tile a plane while heptagons and octagons aren't. The historical reason why the lettering system is so weird is that it's actually adapted from another classification problem, the study of root systems, which are integral to Lie groups and Lie algebras. In this classification, H and most of the I groups aren't included, and B and C are distinct from each other. Root systems also have their own graph notation called Dinkin diagrams, so if you go looking stuff up on the internet, then beware of a lot of conflicting terminology, especially when it comes to the lettering. All of this and more is what we will look at in the next video. So if you want to get notified when that video comes out, then subscribe and ding that bell, I hate saying that combination of words. The second video will assume some background knowledge on linear algebra, so if you don't have that and you're particularly dedicated, you might choose to brush up on that in the meantime. 
That all being said, I don't want to sweep the combinatorial side of things under the rug. Coxeter systems alone contain a huge number of subdisciplines, including the Bruhut order, simplicial complexes, and folded galleries. One of the biggest topics related to Coxeter systems is the Kazdan Lustig polynomials, which have a massive combinatorial side in addition to being important to representation theory. Don't expect videos on those because they're not my area of expertise. To finish off, I want to re-emphasize how complicated the classification of finite Coxeter groups actually is. It's not just four infinite families and six exceptional cases. The families have a lot of overlaps, and the exceptional cases are often strongly linked to certain infinite families. Recall how we obtain the D groups using the B groups. These sorts of connections are everywhere, both in the study of Coxeter systems and in the bigger study of finite groups. It's important to remember that the classification isn't always everything, and what matters is all the connections you find between the parts of the classification along the way. To illustrate at least some of these connections, here's a diagram of all of the ways in which one irreducible finite Coxeter system is a maximal parabolic subgroup of another, that is, when one is a subgraph of the other. At this point, I think we've reached peak cursedness, so I'm going to stop, and we'll pick this back up in the next video.